Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for the amazing introduction. Um, the talk is called Product Lessons from the Happiest Place on Earth. And I'm here to tell you that I'm really glad you're here because for the first time ever, two of the world's biggest enemies are teaming up to teach you some stuff. Um, and I mean, it's all happening right here, right now. So aren't you glad you're not at the coffee break and that you made it for the beginning of the talk? I'm glad. <laughs> um, well, these enemies are not necessarily known as enemies, but as soon as you see it, you will know why. We are talking about, sorry, we're talking about Walt Disney, and we're also talking about Universal Studios. But before we get into the lessons that they're going to teach us today, I want to give you some context. I actually wrote this talk when I was in line for this roller coaster. Um, as you can see, it's a pretty amazing roller coaster. And does anyone like theme parks here? I really hope so. Yes. Okay. My people. Very good. Um, as you know, the rides are amazing, but one thing they don't really show all the time is this part, the line. I was in line for this roller coaster for over an hour, and I was told that it was a pretty good day, that I got a short line. Um, the crazy part is not that I was in line for an hour. The crazy part is that I was actually entertained. I was entertained for an hour, and I, as the product person that I am, started asking myself, um, why am I entertained? Like, how in hell are they keeping me entertained? I'm not even in the park. I'm not even in the ride. I'm just standing here waiting to ride this roller coaster. Well, we're going to get to that. Um, and I already got this amazing intro, but basically I am a product leadership coach. That means I partner with founders and product leaders to help them build products and teams that customers love that also drive real results for the business. Um, before this, I built products across nine different industries in three continents. And I am so happy to be here in Krakow. You all, if you live here, you live in a beautiful city. If you don't live here, you get to visit a beautiful city just like I do, uh, which is really fun. So let's get on to business. And we're going to talk about five magical lessons. Um, and I do love that for this talk, I can literally wear like as close to a princess dress as possible and it's on brand. Um, so I'm taking full advantage of it. Um, the first one, first lesson is deliver experiences to your users. So both at Disney and at Universal Studios, people really don't care about what these people are building, right? They don't care about that. They care about the experience that you are enabling them to have. And that is what's happening with your products as well, with anything that you're building. If people tell you they care about what you're building, they're lying to you. I'm sorry. Um, but they are caring about what you're able to have due to what they're building. So here are a few examples of how they nail the experience. So first one is this is not even in the park, okay? This is a hotel. Um, when you go to Universal Studios, you can stay at the Hard Rock Hotel. That's one of their main hotels. And their whole idea is that they want you to feel like a rock star. So when you walk in, you're kind of like, oh my God, I'm at this like show. Um, if you go to the pool, they have music underwater that you can listen to, which is pretty cool. But I think the core thing that is epic in terms of the experience is that they have a guitar room service. So imagine room service, like you're ordering food, but you're ordering guitars. Imagine feeling like a superstar. They can just pick from a menu of guitars. I play guitar. I always have, and I love it. Um, so I could literally pick multiple guitars and have them brought to my room. That made me feel like a superstar. Am I a superstar? No, but I definitely felt like one. Um, the next one, we are in the park now, right? Um, you made it in, there's this epic ride, and I picked the ride that is old by design because some of you could be like, well, they had time to think about this, or like, this is like a new thing. This ride is old, okay? This ride is older than me. I think when I first went to Disney World and Universal Studios, this ride was there. Um, and it's the E.T. ride. Does anyone like E.T., the movie? Yeah? 
great movie, very beautiful. Um, and when you walk in, there's already the smell, there's like fog, you're in a forest. That's the line, by the way. And then they ask for your name and you give your name and you don't think much of it. You go through the whole ride. And at the end, E.T. thanks you for saving E.T. How amazing. I mean, I felt like a hero. I was like, what? I just saved E.T. That's great. Um, and then any Harry Potter fans out here? Yes, me too. Um, I mean, you literally get to ride Hagrid's roller coaster and be in the bike. There's actually a separate line for the bike. If you want to be on the bike and you need to wait longer, I waited longer. I didn't care. I was like, Are you, am I really going to sit in the sidecar? No way. Um, so you get to sit in Hagrid's bike and ride through the Forbidden Forest. And the best thing is that, yes, the ride is amazing and the roller coaster is really fun, but there's so much that they did in the line, in the special effects that make you feel like you're actually there. So much that it inspired me to write this talk. It did look way less pretty when I was in line. It was all in my notes app, uh, but eventually I put it into slides. And then finally, the one that inspired my dress, um, you literally get to have dinner with Cinderella when you go to um, Disney World. You go in the castle, you get to meet Cinderella. Um, it's pretty amazing, right? So why am I showing you all these awesome things? Because I want you to stop thinking about products and start thinking about experiences. I want you to stop thinking about features and things that you're building and start thinking about real outcomes that your customers can see. So I'm going to leave you with a lot of things to think about today. And the first one is, what experience can you create? Second magical lesson is engage people when they're loving you. So as we know, there are good times, bad times, and terrible times to ask something from people. Um, and if you're building products, in whatever role you're in, if you're in product, in design, in engineering, it's your job to figure out when that right time is to ask something to someone that you need. So I'm first going to show you what not to do. Um, so is anyone familiar with this screen? Yeah? I hate this screen so much. And I built apps before, so I understand that we need to have it. But for some reason, it's always in the middle of an action that we're trying to take. It's like, I'm trying to do something, and it's like, would you like to rate the app? And I'm like, no, I don't want to rate the app. I want to finish my task. And then once I'm successful, I will give you a better rating. Um, so, I mean, not to hate on people that are building apps, but, and I understand we need this, right, for the app store. It's really important but we need to know when to ask things. So let's take a um, page out of Disney's playbook and talk about how to do it. So there's always the ending for any ride at the gift shop. And I'm not talking about any gift shop. I'm talking about a gift shop that is tailor-made to the experience you just had. So let's talk about the roller coaster I went in that I wrote this talk in. I had just flown through the Forbidden Forest. I was feeling magical. I was like, wow, like my Hagrid's acceptance letter could be arriving at any point. Um, and then when I leave the roller coaster, I step into this beautiful store that feels like I am at Hogwarts, right? Um, I was like, I would never buy a wand, but I was like, maybe I need one. Like now, like I'm so committed to this thing because I just got this whole experience. Um, so and the, the beauty of it is like, it feels personal. It feels right because it's tied to that experience. If they just built like the universal store and dropped me with like a whole bunch of things, I would not be interested. But since it feels so personal to what I just did, I loved it. So my question to you is, when is the right time for your product? When does it make sense to ask someone to do something? And what's that kind of carrot that you're going to weave into the experience. The third one, and I mean, this should be in every talk uh, in some way, shape, or form, so it's in my talk, it made it, um, is don't make users think. Don't make people think. And I'm encouraging you to build experiences that are... Hmm. That, oh. A lot of buildup for this slide. We got it. Um, 
build experiences that are great and that they feel obvious. So the word I want you to focus on is obvious. Um, so I love great experiences. That is awesome. But they need to feel so natural that it feels like an obvious next step for people. So my question to you is how might you build something that's obviously right for your users? And I'm going to give two examples um, of very awesome apps or um, products that are even like physical products that both Disney and Universal have built out in order to make the experience obviously better. The first one is the park planner. So has anyone used this app before? If you, yeah. So the part they don't tell you besides the lines, right? Like if you're seeing anything about going to an amusement park, there's no photos of the lines. There's also no photos of like the chaos that happens around. It's normally like these people smiling, there are balloons, there's like all of that. Um, it's pretty chaotic and I go as like an adult, right? So it's already chaotic for me. I'm imagining like if you're going with kids, like toddlers, people running around, like that must be even worse. Um, so they built this app that is already on your phone. You're already using it. And the whole idea is that you're there to enjoy the park. So it's going to make it easier for you to enjoy the park. You can pick the rides you want to go in. They even create an itinerary for you. If you want to walk less, there's that option. You can be like, I want to walk the least amount possible because the park is really big. So they create the optimal route for you. Very, very cool. And then the other one solves the line problem, actually. So the other one is called the fast pass. So I think like Dono Duck is doing a great job here. He's just saying like, get a time, why wait in line, right? And the whole idea is that lines are really long and they're annoying. No one goes to the park for the lines. They go to the park for entertainment. So why don't we just enable people to go to that ride, get a time, and then come back and experience the ride with no line? Um, so that happens. They've actually gotten really smart and they've taken advantage of this for an upgrade opportunity. So now something that used to be free is now paid. So a lot of the fast passes are now paid, um, but people feel so much of a pain in terms of standing in line. They normally don't write talks when they're in line. You know, they don't get this inspired. Um, so they're willing to pay and they did enough tests for that. So now it's a paid experience. So in order for you to find your version of the fast pass or the park planner, you need to know two really core things from your users. First is what they need. What is that like deep need and pain point? And then also what they desire. And knowing one is not enough. If you just know the problem, that will only give you one view. If you know the problem and the outcome that they want, that will give you an opportunity to figure out how you can actually solve for that. The next one is make it a no-brainer to upgrade. So the example I'm going to use for this one is Hogwarts Express. So as a Harry Potter fan, and I know there's some people mostly in this area that are also Harry Potter fans, love that. Um, I've dreamed of the day that I would get my acceptance letter to Hogwarts, right? I was like, wow. This will be incredible when it happens. And a core part of getting to Hogwarts is actually writing Hogwarts Express. So when I first saw that they were going to build the Hogwarts Express at Universal Studios, I was like, oh my God, I need to go. And Universal was so smart because they actually split Harry Potter World, which is a very popular part of the park, into two of their parks. So you can't visit Harry Potter World just by going to one park. You need to visit it by going to both parks. And especially in order to ride the train, um, you need to actually have a two park ticket. So you need to pay the most amount of money you can pay for that ticket in order to go on the train. So that's what it takes. It was a business decision, right? To split Harry Potter World across the two parks. They did it in a really smart way. They had Diagonal Alley on one side. There's a really fun roller coaster that you can ride and you go through the bank, all of that. It's awesome. And then they have Hogwarts on the other side. So if you want to experience both and if you want to ride the train, most importantly, you need to have tickets for both parks. And I feel like no presentation is complete 
without some sort of a Venn diagram, right? Like there's always one. Um, and this one is pretty common. Like there's always the like user value and business value. But I don't agree with how most people represent user value and business value because they normally put the circles the same size. I actually think that you need more user value in order to get business value. Um, so you need to focus on your users in order for the user to actually care about the business because unfortunately they don't care that much. We care, right? They care about themselves mostly. Um, so in this particular case, it was a decision for the business that added real value to users. That's why it works. And it added so much value that people decided to use it. And now the latest time I went to the park, you can actually upgrade your ticket at the train, which I was like, oh, this is so smart. So if I hadn't made the decision yet to decide to be on these two parks, now I can right here. So again, on not making me think, again, on making it really easy for me to upgrade. So how can you offer something so great within your product, within everything that you're doing that makes it a no-brainer for people to choose to upgrade? Well, the answer is gonna maybe seem obvious because we've been talking about this, without really diving deep yet, but it all comes from deeply knowing your users. Um, if you just think you know them, it's gonna be really hard to actually um, get to that ideal solution because I mean, I've thought I've had amazing ideas and then I tested them and I was like, well, that was a disaster. Like <laughs> no one likes this, right? And it doesn't really matter because as long as we build experimentation and as long as we build user centricity into our process, um, we can really get to a great solution for both the users and also the business. So in order to do this, you need to understand what matters to them and the why behind it. I would say the what is important because it gives you kind of that snapshot, but the why is truly where the beauty lies because it shows you how people think, it shows you what they care about, and it shows you what kind of triggers you can pull in order to build an experience that they will love. And in order to do this, you need a mix of both qualitative and quantitative data. Only one is not enough, and I know people that build products always have a preference, right? They're like, oh, I'm a quantitative person, I like data. The other one's like, oh, I like qualitative data. And I'm like, great, make a friend, you know, make a friend that likes the other one or learn to like both because you actually need both of them. Um, and here's why. Quantitative data shows you what's going on and gives you that snapshot, but qualitative data shows you why that is happening and shows you that ability to connect the dots. Now on to the last lesson, which is make something that works for users um, and for you, but mostly for them. If there's a theme in this talk is that your users matter a lot and we should really focus on them. Um, and I will tell you that I saved the best for last. Um, I always like to do this because I think we need to reward people for getting through the talk and being here. Um, and also because best for last sounds nice. But I will tell you some inconvenient truths before. So we're going to have to get through those inconvenient truths and get on board with it in order to get to the best part. Does that sound good? Are we ready? Okay, great. Um, let's start light. Um, a lot of people think users care about their product, right? Who here thinks users care about their product? What they're building, yeah? Okay, that is very nice. Um, unfortunately, I'm here to tell you they don't. They don't care about your product. They don't care about you. They don't care about the business. I've worked for companies that have like really, really high uh, brand loyalty and value. People still don't care, right? And I'm here to tell you like it's not their job to care, honestly. They already pay you. They're already a customer, right? Um, that's what they're doing. So to massively oversimplify this, um, they care about their problems and their happiness. Like those are the two things people really care about. It's like, what are the things that are causing me pain and what are the things that could cause me happiness and the like? So it's your job to build something that solves their problems in a way they'll choose to use it um, that also works for the business. So 
One thing I'll say that I think is important to highlight here is the choose to use it. So there are a few different um, product risks that we tackle when we are thinking about what to build. And there's usability risk, which is like, can someone use it? Is it usable by them? And then there's value risk, which is like, is this valuable enough that someone's going to choose to go this route and choose to use it? That's what I'm talking about. And that is way harder to, to do than actually um, testing out for um, just usability. So it's not, can they use it? But it's like, will they choose to use it? The other question is like, would they pay to use this? And would they continue to pay? Even if you're building for um, B2B. So the order is important here. Again, it first needs to work for the users and then it needs to work for the business. So now that we've gotten this out of the way, we can talk about one of my favorite products ever and Disney's exceptional execution. So the product I want to talk about is called the Magic Band. Has anyone heard about the Magic Band ever? Yes. Okay. Yeah. The amusement park person, you're really knocking it out of the park. I love it. This is great. Um, perfect. So the Magic Band is basically your guide and your key to Disney. So as soon as you like step out of the plane in Orlando, you can probably do anything with the Magic Band, which is pretty amazing. And they didn't do it alone. I think every single like design agency was contacted. It was a huge investment by them. Um, and I mean, it paid off. Here is what Wired wrote in 2015. Okay. So like a while ago about them. So they say, if you want to imagine how the world would look like in a few years, once your cell phones become the keepers of both our money and identity, skip Silicon Valley and book a ticket to Orlando. I mean, what a slap in the face of Silicon Valley. I used to live there until two years ago. And I remember reading this and I was like, oh my God, we're like in trouble here. Um, but it's because Orlando was the home of the magic band. And my core question for you all is why did it work? And I'll tell you, it was like the key to your room. If you were staying at a Disney hotel, it was the key to the park. You could pay with it. Um, if you had any show tickets, it was all there. Um, so why did it work? D does anyone have any ideas for me? Eh? Easy convenience. What else? You're gonna have Magic experience that works. Okay. Love that. Yeah, I mean, it created an exceptional experience. That is the core thing. And it really pushed the boundaries. I mean, like we were putting personal information in there, credit card, like all of that. I know we're in Europe and there's like a lot less, um, what's the right word? Uh, a lot less um, willingness to just like give out data than in the US. Um, but it was still pushing the boundaries, right? And the reason it really worked is it delivers what users wanted before they wanted it. So there's that very good quote that like, if you ask people what they want, they'll tell you a faster horse. They didn't ask people what they wanted here. They saw how people interacted. They understood their pain points. They invested a lot in actually making this work. And then they got the results, um, which was this magical park experience. So I'm going to walk through um, a little bit how it worked. So first, you would book your ticket online. Very, very simple. Very easy. Um, then you would pick your favorite rides. This was actually one of my favorite rides ever. It no longer exists. And it's going to turn into, I think, like a Moana or Princess and the Frog. Who knows? Um, eventually, it's going to reopen. Um, then you get an optimized and personalized itinerary. How epic is that? And they know what you want because you told them your favorite, right? Um, after that, the magic band arrives in your home, which already starts the magical experience, right? Like even before you've gone on vacation, even before you went on the plane, you're already getting this thing that is showing you like you're going there. You're actually going to go have this experience. And it tells you like, I'm yours. Try me on. It's already helping you on board into the experience that you're going to be having. And then... The magic band is your key, your wallet, and your guide to everything at Disney. So it enabled a very frictionless experience for guests. I think people said like very similar things here, frictionless. And 
The beauty is that in the background of this frictionless experience, Disney was learning everything about you, right? They were like, oh, they like pancakes. They like this. They like Coke. They want to go to this ride. They like this show. Uh, they spend X amount of time at this restaurant at this time. Um, and it was making recommendations for you that were making your experience the best it can be. It was also suggesting things that you want that are good for them, right? So a core thing here is that the Magic Band was such an incredible product because it was good for Disney, but it was even better for the user. So here are the five magical lessons that I have for you all. And it's like, if you need a photo to be like, I came to the talk, I learned things, this is the one you take, you know? Um, so the first one is all around delivering experiences to your users and really pushing the boundary from thinking about features or products and thinking about those experiences that you can create um, to engage people when they're loving you, not in other times, because you're much more likely to get um, them to do what you want. Um, to not make users think, very, very important. To make it a no-brainer for people to upgrade and to make something that works for the users and for you, but to focus on them. So these five lessons have one thing in common, at least one thing. In order for them to work, you need to deeply know your customers. And I mean, I feel like I sound like a broken record now, but it's so important uh, to get to know your customers because you need to know what problem to solve and how to solve it. And I do want to separate these two because I feel like a lot of people kind of like mesh them together and they think about like, oh, like they have this problem. Let's just think about the solution. And I encourage every team that I coach to focus mostly on the problem. It's like if we have 10 minutes, I'd focus eight minutes on the problem and then two minutes on the solution because we really need to understand why that problem is there in order to even have a chance of figuring out how to solve the problem. So to win at creating great experiences, you need to align both your business and your customer interests. I see a lot of people that call like people in the business, the customer, they're not the customer. If they don't use the product, they're not a customer, they're not a user, they have a different name, they're normally a little hard to deal with, and they're called a stakeholder. Um, and their interests are great too, but they need to be aligned with the customer. So to end on a magical note, um, because the best way to end, I want to tell you guys that in product, like inspiration really comes from every experience. Um, I mean, I never thought I would write an entire talk when I was in line for a roller coaster, right? So I should know. Um, what I would encourage you, because today is an entire day of inspiration, right? You're hearing from so many incredible speakers. You heard from them already. You're hearing again. You're meeting new people that you might not have met before. You might be in a different city, right? I would encourage you to look around and find your inspiration. Because what I can assure you is that your next great product idea, it's not gonna come from looking at Jira. As much as I love Jira, it's not gonna do it for us, right? So thank you so much, everyone. I would love to stay in touch with you. Here's my LinkedIn and my email. Thank you. Thank you.